1995, Wizards of the Coast released a set called Chronicles, a new set that was not an official expansion and did not contain any new cards. That's right, Chronicles was 100% reprints, containing previously printed cards from Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends, and The Dark. Its original working title was The Best Magic Cards of 1994, which is obvious when you see that it included such hits as Dak and Blackblade, Craw Giant, and Chromium. The set increased supply of these cards to the point that prices tanked, collectors complained, and for the first time ever, many Magic the Gathering players worried that Wizards of the Coast had killed Magic. To quell fears, it was not long before Wizards of the Coast responded by creating the Reserve List. That's right, the Reserve List came about in part because the price on Arcades Sabbath dropped due to reprints. So bad was the impact of Chronicles that Wizards of the Coast never did another set like it. Not until 2013, when the first Modern Masters was printed in very cautious limited supply and at an MSRP of $6.99 per pack. And these were them, Chronicles. I am so excited to get to be able to open these up today and also talk with all of you about my thoughts on reprints, the white border, the reserve list, and whether or not any of this helps or hurts games like Magic the Gathering or even Flesh and Blood, which has recently put out its own history pack, which is essentially Chronicles, where they took their most in-demand cards, they took their first set of cards that had supply production issues, and there wasn't very many of them made, and they reprinted them here in affordable packs, but there's no foils, and they're in the white border. How are prices on that compared to what Chronicles did to Magic? I got a lot of thoughts, but I want to open these up as I talk. So let's take a look. These are so gorgeous. It's such a, and by the way, yes, this is another unscripted video by me for you. I hate them. You all say you like hearing my unscripted thoughts. I'm going to do my best to put a little coffee in me, but boy, do I feel awkward. But I also feel very nostalgic looking at these. Isn't that beautiful? Just beautiful little design. And it takes me back to high school. In high school, if I remember correctly, these were actually cheaper than a regular booster pack. They printed so much of it. Again, this is what caused the reserve list because they made so much of this, it just decimated prices of cards. And then people were upset and Wizards' response was, we promise we won't do it again, but in probably the worst possible way. So here we go. Oh man. So. These cards are so old and have been so improperly stored that there's definitely a little bit of warping on them. I've seen that when I open up old packs, that the cardboard, probably from being kept in terrible storage conditions. And it's really funny too that Chronicles is what gave us the reserve list. When look at these cards, who cares? Wall of Vapor, people were upset about Goblin Shrine from the dark being reprinted or Gazban Ogre. And so as a result, like the Moxes weren't even in this. Bog Rats, oh, but I just love it. And there's Urza Tower. This was one of my favorites were the Urza Lands. And I know, I know they're super powerful today and everyone knows them. I felt like they were something very special back in the day, being able to get that much mana just for artifacts. I really liked artifacts. Oh, and an upside down City of Brass. Isn't that interesting? Well, here's a card, ooh. Here's a card, why are they upside down? Here's a card that I can stick in my commander deck. Good old Mark Tadeen artwork, who did Emrakul, the Anne's Torn. And then here's one of the original Elder Dragons. Super Warp, look at these cards. Oh my goodness. So I guess it's not just foils. I got foils that are flatter than that. <laughs> oh. That is a little disappointing. I hope these other ones I purchased from Card Kingdom, sponsor of this video. I, maybe I shouldn't say that, but newer packs are, I mean, like they didn't store it since the 90s, but you can go to cardkingdom.com forward slash TCC and buy accessory, yeah, 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 yeah. help the channel out, cardkingdom.com forward slash TCC. The, our motto is it's not their fault someone stored these Chronicles packs poorly for 20 plus years. What's very interesting 
we could maybe throw up in our mouths a little. I mean, our price on this is a lot of these cards have actually increased in price finally, where there's so much demand for magic now, even cards like that City of Brass are going up. Is the reserve list something that should have come about because of Chronicles? I don't think so. I don't think they needed to do that at all. Or I think that the original intent of the reserve list where they said cards can come on and off of it, they should have said that and done that more often because then they could say, because most of the cards on the reserve list are nonsense. And you could even make an argument for things like the Moxes being so powerful and only played in vintage, keep them on the reserve list for, I guess, collectors, investors. But for goodness sakes, take the original duels off, right? So update it and say, you know, the original duels need to come off of it. If only that, like what else is on the reserve list? Guy is Cradle. Take those cards off. Oh, what a trip down memory lane though. Looking at this, Felden's Cane. If you saw my skit where we had uh, Felden, which was really my friend Shivam playing Felden, Olivia made him a cane that looked just like that. Very cool. Rune Sword. Target attacking creature gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Any creature damaged by that creature cannot regenerate this turn. Oh no. If such a creature receives lethal damage this turn, remove it from the game. If the target leaves play before end of turn, bury Rune Sword. Hey, and an Urza's Mind to go with my Urza's Tower. Very nice. In a lot of ways, it was good that Chronicles reprinted the Urza lands because it kept them cheap for a long time. Craw Giant, what artwork? Look at that iconic artwork. You just don't see art like that anymore. No disrespect to current magic artists, but these cards are so memorable. Yeah, some of it is bad art by our standards, but at the same time, it's memorable art. And I think that some of the standardization and even I'm going to say homogeny of current magic art makes a lot of the cards forgettable, where what are the real iconic artworks that are blazed into your memory from recent sets? I think Kamigawa had a lot of them, but Kamigawa was something weird and special. And that's how I feel about a lot of the old art is that it's just really memorable because in some ways it was very distinct, very special, very unique. There was a different sort of fantasy feel to it than present day stuff. I think Chronicles, if it had just been printed a lot less, another rune sword, would have been just fine. But because of what happened, it not only created the reserve list, but created this idea that they don't want to reprint cards. They don't want to tank prices. And I think they profit off of that now, because now you say that's why the packs are so expensive. I think that if they did a white bordered Magic the Gathering set, they would not do it right. <gasps> they just wouldn't do it right. They would not want the prices to come down. And I don't think that it just being, I, I don't have any more Chronicles packs. Okay, I'm gonna open just one of these. Now, I need a card and I'm not doing, I know buy singles and the card is less than the price of a booster box but I really, really need a card. Let's see if I get it while I talk. I just want an excuse to talk. I'm gonna monetize uh, doing something stupid, which is opening up. And let's look at and compare the white border flesh and blood cards, because maybe you haven't seen them, but I don't think white border is really what makes it cheap. I think that it was the plentifulness. I need a scissor here for this. <laughs> Well, I don't have a scissor. I, I just had in my drawer a pen, but that'll get it in. There we go. I think it was the plentifulness that actually just made them so cheap. Does white border look good or not? I mean, that's an aesthetic choice that's debatable. I think it probably honestly doesn't look as good as black border, but since we've avoided white border for so long, history pack volume one, essentially chronicles, but flesh and blood. 
Oh my God, look at all these packs. No promise I talk and open all of these. There's so many. Oh my goodness. These are like 80 to 100 a box. And the idea was that, you know, hey, it was really, really hard uh, to get these early packs. Prices were really, really high. A lot of people felt priced out and the company's like, all right, well, let's reprint everything in beautiful, glorious white border, make it available affordably. And now people can get the cards to play because Flesh and Blood is really leaning heavy into in-person play. They want people to have the cards. It doesn't benefit them in that strategy for the cards to be so expensive. And so that's what they did. Another interesting thing about this is that they didn't put any foils in here, which I'm not sure I agree with, to be honest with you. The idea was, again, they really wanted to keep the cost of this low. So they put no black border, no foils. And I think back to Magic the Gathering 7th and 8th edition, which were white border corsets, but the foils were in black border. I think that created a nice little element. Is there an issue? Is there an issue with people buying up the boxes then to get, say, this Dawnblade and Black Border foil or something like that? And I think there is that issue to a degree, but it also means people might be buying up and liquidating the contents to keep it a lot cheaper. This was something in Magic that we talked about with Masterpieces, where the idea for those sets that had Masterpieces in them was that some of the people with a lot of income or stores and stuff were buying and cracking boxes and cases to get those cards and all the rest of the cards in the set lowered in price as a result. I don't know really if the white border even has an effect on prices because here's what you may not know if you're a Magic player watching this. The cost of the chase cards that were reprinted in white border here is not that much cheaper, not that much cheaper than the black border versions from the original set. Isn't that interesting? It's a little bit cheaper and there is some variance depending on the card, but the truth is, so let's say one of, one of the cards, I wouldn't mind getting a spring tunic in here. I really just want a Teclo Foundry Heart for my dash deck, I don't have one. And there you go. So the Teclo Heart, it's going for about $80 if I open a white border one here. $80, which is the cost of the box. Yes, I know. If I don't get one in here, I should have just bought it. We're, we we're, we want to have a conversation here today, though. Reverberate. That's a magic card. Cool, though. Overloop. Um, getting distracted. So it's maybe the black border is about 20 bucks more. 10, 20 bucks more. I don't have it in front of me than the white border, but that's not that different. What's interesting is that Flesh and Blood has art treatment versions of like $2 cards that are going for way more. I mean, uh, uh, if you look at some of the dragons in Draw My Dragons, there are some really expensive versions of those dragons. They're gorgeous. But if you just want to build and play, there's a, a, a $2 version. In fact, you can put like a $30 Dragons deck together. Maybe skip one or two pieces of equipment that have some really reasonable alternatives. And there you go. You've got your $30 Draw My Dragons deck. My Dash deck is about 30 bucks. Uh, until I get this Teclo Foundry Heart. Then it's going to go up by about 80 Watch I don't get it. Watch me not get it. Buy singles, Professor. So did this need to be white border if the prices are the same? I like the idea of it as a way to distinguish and yes, in some ways diminish the reprint of the special cards. It makes it so that my black border from the first set is more special, but it's providing game pieces to everyone which is great. I think though that there is something to be said for all nostalgia aside, Black Border just looks a lot better. And I know that there's a big resurgence, myself included, of people liking the White Border. I do, I'm, I'm looking at these cards and honestly, I'm thinking, all right, look at that. That looks really cool in the White Border. 
I'm used to seeing it salt the wound. <laughs> That's how I feel about a few things. Of uh, I'm used to seeing it riled up. There. What is this? My pack? <laughs> it's the professor in a pack. Zipper hit. That's in my dash deck. Um. Sorry, getting off track. It's a nostalgia thing. It's a different thing. It's like, oh, I kind of like it. Kano, cool. Uh, I kind of like it because I don't see it often, but the truth is, Lesson in Lava, that you're just going to really find that the black border is a, a lot of a fancier, a lot of a more better way to, to show off cards. I think the issue is more just in the reprinting. I don't think the white border is what tanked Chronicles prices for so long. And here we have cards in a white border and they're not cheap er by a significant margin than the must have cards. If anything, it just speaks really well to the way they printed the history pack boxes that you can go out and get them at such an affordable price when that was a big issue with those early boxes. I think they, they must have really done their numbers right because these are still available at that cost. And yeah, the white border version in here is 20 bucks cheaper. If it was black border, would it be the same price? Maybe it would. Is that, is getting a $100 card down to $80 on the secondary market worth it to do an entire set in white border? I'm not opposed. I just think that they need to do history pack two in another three to four years maybe, or whatever it is. You don't want to do these too often. It's an interesting choice that they're not trying the master's set approach. Look at that artwork on Zen State. Beautiful, beautiful, come to fight. Uh, that they're not doing that master's set approach of we're gonna make this expensive, we're gonna make this big, we're gonna now these days put in special treatments. I don't like much of that, you know, uh, but there they make a lot of money. And uh, so LSS, I mean, you wanna make a lot of money with these flesh and blood ones? Do all foil packs, all black border and make it cost seven times as much. And then no one is actually there playing your game but they want people to be playing it. And maybe even if this set isn't the most profitable thing for them, I don't know their numbers. Um, they're doing pretty good though, but I don't know their overall numbers. Maybe, maybe it's about getting the cards into the hands of the players so the players can play and pick it up. I think that's really cool, if that's the philosophy. My philosophy on reprints though, has always been reprint them in the main sets. So let's take that, you know, spring tunic, which is, I think, the infamous flesh and blood card at this point, even though it isn't that necessary and run in a lot of decks anymore. But it just, it's become kind of, is it fair to say, people who play flesh and blood and magic, is it fair to say spring tunic is the black lotus of flesh and blood? It's certainly not as expensive. I can get one for a hundred something dollars. There's one in this, but it's like, should that be reprinted in every set? I don't know. I kind of favor that idea of like, if the card is being played, reprint it. You don't need to reprint it into the ground. Cards should cost something. And another thing I haven't talked about is this idea of, well, what do you want magic cards or flesh and blood cards or Pokemon cards or whatever to cost? And I do want them to have value. I would hate it if I was opening up sets where I'm spending four bucks on a pack and it has 80 cents of cards in it all the time. Sometimes that's gonna happen, Combustible Courier, that's in my dash deck as well. Um, sometimes that's gonna happen, but Enlightened Strike, that's a couple of bucks, I think. Yeah, this is a couple of bucks. I'm gonna put that one. I speed impact, my dash deck again. So much of my dash deck used these cards, too bad I already, I bought my singles and blinged it out. My blinged out dash deck. Uh, there's a great quote by Richard Garfield where they're asking him about card prices. And he says, I don't think any card should be over 20 bucks unless it's just a special treatment. So if it's like special art or foil, who cares, right? But as long as there's a game piece version 
Oh, optical monocle. I know that's not a good one, but I like the flavor. Uh, if there's a game piece version of it out there, that's what matters. No more than 20 bucks for the game pieces and only those on a few of the cards. Keep the cards in that range and then special versions can be above it. And that's what we see in Flesh and Blood with, again, my example being some of those components in the Dragon's deck. Uh, beautiful. I wish I could, I had some in front of you to show off. You can look it up. Some of those treatments, just gorgeous, very expensive, but there's $2 versions and that's the way it should be. Should there be a, a $10 version, $20 version of a few cards? I think that's okay. What about a card like Spring Tunic that is uh, 100, 150? Most decks might want it. One difference with that is that you only need one copy ever, literally for all your decks. Uh, equipment stays out of the main deck. Pedal to the metal, that's in my dash deck too. Um, stays out of the main deck, so you just need one Spring Tunic. You don't need five for five Flesh and Blood decks, but also you're not really running it in five. I think it's okay for a couple cards to have that chase price. Like a good example in Magic would be Oracle of Moldaya. I didn't mind that Oracle of Moldaya for a period was so expensive because it was just this, if it was just this one card, the problem I have is that so many cards in Magic are that expensive these days that putting together any deck to play at your local game store is going to cost so much money I think a few chase is okay. I think some nice treatments are okay. I don't think every card should be 10 cents. I don't think this should be Netrunner where you just go and buy the entire set. I like trading for cards. Some of my happiest memories are being in the game store, pulling out my trade binder. I'll give you these two $5 cards for that $10 card. Uh, throw in that, that 50 cent foil there, okay? Sure. Sutcliffe's research notes. So is it about quadrant theory? If you get that joke, here we go. I'm gonna put that aside so I can tweet out that terrible joke. It all comes down to gorgeous art. It all comes down to whether people can play the game in my book. Can they play it? Is flesh and blood prohibitively expensive? I don't think so. I think there are affordable decks and there are also very expensive ones, but I do not subscribe to the argument that it is uh, prohibitively expensive to say, attend an event at your local game store, to go to a calling event and sit down and shuffle up and play uh, with flesh and blood. I just don't think it is. I, I know there are so many tournament level lists that can be put together for under $100, for $30 even. Not maybe all of them. And yes, if you're ready to become the best player in the world, then you're gonna have to get some of those more expensive equipment cards. And that is where the cost comes in flesh and blood, are those equipment cards. They do cost a lot, the best ones. Now, by a lot, we're talking $100, $200. I think there's one that's like, you know, uh, we've got some pieces where the cheap version is, is above that range, but you only need one. What's a play set of Misty Rainforests cost? Ooh. What's a uh, play set of uh, Scalding Tarns cost? Less now that they've been reprinted. Hey, hey, reprint cards. What a concept. But if you want to compare with me prices of going down to a Flesh and Blood Calling and what you need to reasonably play in one, to going down to a modern well, I wanted to say GP, but there aren't GPs anymore. A modern tournament, RCQ. What that modern deck is gonna cost you? Heck, even that Pioneer deck? Don't tell me Flesh and Blood is more expensive. At the very least, it's on par with standard Pioneer costs. And it, unlike standard, it doesn't rotate. And unlike Pioneer, uh, it's fun to play. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. It's a joke. I like Pioneer. I just did a Pioneer video. I like games. I like magic. I like flesh and blood. I love Pokemon. Pokemon did reprints for their anniversary uh, of their cards and they didn't put it in a white border or anything and they sold the packs for cheap. Now Pokemon is subsidized by their giant empire 
and many people have said that the trading card game in some ways doesn't turn an overall profit, but is almost used as an advertising wing. Uh, throttle, that's in my dash deck. Uh, sort of thing. And I don't know if that's true. Robe of Rapture. Cool. Not not expensive. I don't think, no, not Robe of Rapture, but I love the art. I always like wizards and the wizardry artwork. Pokemon's another one. What's it cost you to go play in a Pokemon tournament? There's some money on that. And there's always gonna be a cost to it. The question is, is, is it reasonable? I like the idea of if you're someone who casually goes down to your local game store to participate in a draft, flesh and blood as sets that are draftable, do draft, take some cards, do some trades, want to do a, a reasonable investment to be able to come in to that store's event, that that shouldn't break the bank. First and foremost, I want to play at my local game store. I should not have to spend $800 just to be able to not goes 0 and 4, right? That's my thing. Now, you want to move from the game store to a GP or the calling, or I guess GPs, sorry, I'm old, uh, RCQ, um, whatever they're calling it now. It's not a GP, but whatever that next level tournament is in Magic or to attend the calling uh, for Flesh and Blood, I think it's reasonable that there's going to be a higher price. I think it's reasonable that cost is going to go up. Does it go up to $1,000, $800, whatever? Uh, some of it, maybe, but that you should still be able to put $30 to $100 decks together to sit down and play at that level. I think that's fine. You're going to go play on the Pro Tour now. You're in the upper echelons of Magic, or you're going to go compete in the Flesh and Blood Pro Tour, the upper echelons of Flesh and Blood. At that point, it isn't about collecting the game necessarily. It isn't about getting those pieces in your draft pack. It's about your competition with the best deck and the best deck is going to be optimized to Teclo Core. It's it's good. I need the, the heart though. I need my Teclo Foundry heart. Where is it? Where's my Teclo? For my dash. So that's kind of how I feel. And I like Richard Garfield's thing of like, yeah, why why is a game piece costing more than 20 bucks? If it's costing more than 20 bucks, reprint it. Or we can apply that to today. White border, black border. I don't think that Wizards doing a master set in white border is anything I'm making an open call for at all. Beautiful art. I'm not doing that. I'm op making an open call for them to reprint the damn cards. But they do, We're, it's too late in Magic because they've already found the profit in cards being expensive. And by keeping the pack cost high, they can print less of it. By keeping the print run low, they ensure prices don't go down dramatically. Good luck seeing fetch lands reprinted anytime soon, given how much they've decreased in value from their recent reprinting. That's not what Wizards is looking to do, in my opinion. Is Flesh and Blood looking to do it? I don't know. I know they're on the right path. Cool. Look at that blood sheath, but I don't play with it. Rune blade equipment. Uh, but I think that they are trying to pick up what Wizards left on the table. I mean, look at this. This set is Chronicles for Flesh and Blood. This is essentially Flesh and Blood's Chronicles, except they didn't destroy their market because the cards in here that I'm looking for is not suddenly a dollar instead of 80. Uh, if I hadn't already blinged out my dash deck, it's got all the cards I need for it and many other decks. If you're running Rune Blades or whatever, got your uh, Rangers, Death Dealer, all of that. So they're definitely, there's your Rune Blade Barrier, pretty. Pedal to the metal, also in my dash deck. So they are trying to learn from Watsi's mistakes. I don't know how much that influences them. I don't know if it's a coincidence. Uh, I don't know what would possess them to say, we want the reprint set to be all white border. Other than, well, that's what Chronicles did. 
But I think that prices are a lot more affordable there. And I think that when I see reprints, I really wish that that wasn't the marketing level that Wizards has taken, but we gotta make money. Is Flesh and Blood making money with this? Was this a mistake for them? Latch, last ditch effort. Love the names of these cards. That I don't know. It makes me a little sad when I think about the fight that I had in Magic all those years. Reprints, reprints, reprints. And how much master sets were gonna be like this. The first master set was $6.99 a pack. $6.99 a pack. But they printed so little of it, rumor has it, because they didn't think it was gonna be something people were that interested in. And then when they saw packs going for $15, $16 and up, that stores were sold out, they said, why should we let people on the secondary market sell these packs for $16 and we're selling them for six. We should sell them for 16. And so a plan was put in action. Master's packs raised to 999. And I was angry about that. Now I wish we were back there. No putting the toothpaste back in the tube, I'm afraid. Bravo. Bravo. Slogism. That's how I feel some mornings. Life for a life. Pack for a pack. What about other color borders? What about other ways? Like the idea of making reprints less desired than the original one. You should make intentionally bad product. I don't know if I agree with that though. I really think it just comes down to just reprint the damn cards. And that's it. Boy, I get a lot of Sutcliffe's research notes. It's just reminding me to tune into the latest episode of Limited Resources. Yay. Are you enjoying this terrible, unscripted conversation? You know, that first part at the beginning was scripted. Wasn't that more interesting than this? Am I saying the same thing? What's next? What do people always ask me about reprints? I think they say, shouldn't everything cost 10 cents? No, it shouldn't. I want cards to cost money. I want to have the thrill of opening a card and trading it. You know what t ticks me off here? I'll tell you. What ticks me off is people say to me, magic players, cards should be worth something. Cards are worth something. No, not like that. And it's, it's like, you know, it, we're unhappy if the cards cost nothing. We're unhappy if the cards cost too much. I hate that because it's fake. That isn't the problem. The problem is, is not being able to buy packs for $4 or around that price because they're all sold out because the company didn't print enough of them. The problem is packs being $9, $14, $20 a pack. The problem isn't cards being $4 $5, that's an $8 card, a $10 card. $10 cards are not the problem. And even, there's my ringtone. Hey, talk about unscripted. Uh, Achilles Accelerator, that is also in my dash deck. I shouldn't have blinged out my dash deck before opening this, but I didn't know I was gonna do it. Become the Ark Knight. <laughs> Very cool. Stir the Aether Winds, that's what I do on my, that's what, that's what my flesh and blood podcast will be called, Stir the Aether Winds. Uh, it's about all the cards being too, exp that you need to play the game with being too expensive. That's all it comes down to, is just cards should have value. They should not cost an arm and a leg. There goes my ringtone. Someone's bothering me. I really, and I turn my phone off so much. I hate it. I want to smash it with a hammer. It won't stop ringing. And nine times out of 10, it is someone bothering me with stupid, useless stuff. Leave me alone. I'm trying to make a video. I'm trying to do work. Pretty. Well, I did not get a spring tunic so far. There's three packs left. Didn't get a spring tunic. Didn't get my uh, Teclo heart from a dash deck. Don't send me one, I'll buy it. Whenever I, I feel very embarrassed whenever I mention a card I need and someone sends it to me, cause it's like, I'm okay. I will buy, I will take care of it. I promise you, I appreciate it. I'm actually over, to be honest with you, I'm a little overwhelmed by that. It's like, I don't deserve that. Like, 
I, I don't keep keep it. If you you got an extra, sell it and you donate the money to charity. Oof. Cool. Oh, you know why I love this art so much? Look right there, Steve Argyle. Love him. I'm like, why do I love that art so much? I actually think there's a lot of really great artists in flesh working in flesh and blood. Staunch response. Oh boy, do I hate getting text messages. Do I hate my phone bothering me? Leave me alone. All right, two packs left. Am I gonna get it? Remember, buy singles. And if you're buying singles, you can buy them from cardkingdom.com forward slash TCC. Woo, Dorinthia. She's so pretty. Sonic Boom. Last pack. At least give me the Teclo heart. I'm not asking for the tunic. I wouldn't even run the tunic. That's the interesting thing. I don't have any decks. God damn it. I am, go I, I, whoever is doing this needs to S the F up. F leave me alone. Salt the wound. Zipper hit. Searing shot. Where are ya? Blood spill invocation. Bracers of Belief. This would be epic if it's my card that I want, that I open this box for. Nope. Time snap potion and spell blade assault. Very pretty, just the same, but. There you have it. Buy singles. However, is the white border something that could be leveraged as a way to reprint cards and keep the cost low? I'm curious to hear from you. Let me know in the comments below what you think the solution, besides printing proxies, yes, that, oop. but besides that, I mean, you wanna play in a tournament. What about a game like Flesh and Blood that still has tournaments, unlike Magic the Gathering? Uh, there you can't have proxies and you want the real cards, so you want the cards to be affordable. Uh, is there history pack? I'm not opening this one. I, I'd rather sell it and get my Teclo heart. Someone can put it up on their shelf. Uh, is their history pack the right idea? It's certainly a better idea than master sets, I'll tell you that. How could master sets have been done in a way that was both profitable and increased the availability of game pieces for players? That's the ticket. Let me know what you think in the comments below. time on Shuffle Up and Play. Today, two of the most evil forces, evil Mark Rosewater and evil Gavin Verhe, we are going to be playing with decks befitting such vile personalities. Eight Rack, Mill. This is the best evil you could find. This is <laughs> oh, oh. So I'm gonna cast Visions of Beyond. Uh, let's just double check that. One, two, five. No, it's oh, gone more, it's gone more, it's gone more. This is the worst. I believe I'll play this polluted delta. Trigger, trigger! Mill three, then mill three again. I'm gonna count how many cars I have in my <laughs> library first off. All right, so I'm gonna split your lands. Right, so it's, it's like we got divorced.